Well, welcome to week one of Humanities 102M. Um, I want to say a little bit at the beginning about where we're going in this course, the span, the scope of this course. This course is going to pick up in about the year 1300. We're going to end right around the year 17. So it's a 400-year span, which is a lot, but compared to, say, Humanities 101, for those of you who have taken that class, you know that 400 years is not that long of, of time. Our focus is going to be almost exclusively on Western Europe, for better or for worse. The rationale for that is that this course, the, the entire humanities program, is focused on Western culture, not because we believe it's superior to other cultures, but simply because Western culture is what we are most immersed in. And Western culture as we know it today was forged in Western Europe during this period of time. So that's why we're focused on that particular region. So what I want to do at the outset is very briefly give you an idea of how much the world is going to change from 1300 to 1700. Let me first kind of tell you a few things about the year 1300 and in a moment I'll, I'll go back and I'll, I'll give you even more background. In the year 1300, Christianity was certainly the predominant religion, the vastly predominant religion in Western Europe. And not only that, but what we would call today the Roman Catholic Church was basically the only game in town. There's maybe a slight exception or two to that, but virtually every Christian in Western Europe in the year 1300, 99.9%, .9 belonged to the same church, the church that was centered in the city of Rome. There is going to be a vibrant and tenacious Jewish minority all throughout this period. You're actually going to have a lecture on medieval Jews that you'll be watching from Dr. Jackson this week. On the political front, there are kingdoms in Western Europe at this time, but from our point of view, they're pretty decentralized. In other words, kings, rulers, don't really have the kind of authority over their realm that we would expect in a modern state. On the technological side of things, guns have just been invented, which of course will be a fateful development. And on the much larger scale, in terms of the way that Europeans of the year 1300 saw themselves, saw the world, saw their place in the world, Earth, planet Earth, was believed to be the dead center of the universe. Everything revolved around Earth, including those heavenly bodies like the sun and the moon that were considered to be perfect. And finally, this is always kind of a mind-blowing one, in the year 1300, there was not a single European who had any inkling of the existence of North or South America. Hard to imagine, but true. So that's 1300. Now we can fast forward to 1700. Remember, this is where we are going to conclude this course and consider some of the profound changes that have taken place. Christianity remains the predominant religion in Europe, but it's a deeply fragmented Christianity. The Roman Catholic Church is still standing, but it is now competing with dozens of different Christian churches, all claiming to be the true church, all um, competing with one another for the adherence of uh, Europeans. 
On the political side of things, we start to see by the, seven, by the year 1700 what we can recognize as a modern state. A modern state is a centralized state in which the ruler of the state has almost exclusive control over things like taxation, the army, the judicial system, and so on. By the year 1700, in addition, not only were all Europeans now fully aware of the existence of the American continent, but the European colonization of those continents was in full swing. <coughs> and finally, in the year 1700, um, this phenomenon that's, that the scholars now call the scientific revolution was coming to an end. And by this time, large numbers of Europeans were acknowledging that the Earth is not, in fact, the center of the universe. Rather, it is the sun. And those heavenly bodies like the sun and the moon that were considered to be perfect, perfect because they were created by God and perfect because they were unaffected by human sin, now people had to acknowledge that these heavenly bodies were not perfect. Um, the sun had spots, the moon had craters, and so on. Now, look, there's a lot of continuity between the year 1300 and 1700. My point is not that everything changes, but I think I've given you some flavor of just what far-reaching changes had occurred in that 400-year span. So now we go back to the beginning. Our starting point is 1300. But of course, we can't just start at the year 1300 as if nothing had gone on before, because really we are sort of parachuting into a story that was already in full swing. Um, for those of you especially who have not taken Humanities 101, you need a little background on the medieval world. And even for those of you who have taken Humanities 101, I, I imagine you could probably use a refresher. Now, the year 1300 is seen as the conclusion of a period known as the High Middle Ages. This is a period from 1000 to 1300. So let me say just a little bit about the High Middle Ages, even though that's not what we're studying in this course. You need to know a little something about it before we pick up our story in 1300. So let's start with religion. I've already said something about this, right? That Roman Catholicism, was the religion of 98%, 99% of Europeans at this time. But I want to say a little bit more about what type of Christianity we're talking about. We're talking about a type of Christianity in which monasticism is extremely important. And not only was monasticism extremely important in the High Middle Ages, but Monasticism was ever expanding and evolving during this time. So in the High Middle Ages, we see a new version of the monastic life, the rise of the friars. The Franciscans would be a good example of friars. These are people who took the traditional monastic vows of poverty and obedience and celibacy, but who did not, like traditional monks, stay uh, in the monastery for the most part, they were out in public. They were mixing and mingling. They were preaching uh, to ordinary people and things like this. So um, we see the monastic life continuing to uh, take on new forms in, in the High Middle Ages. The High Middle Ages is also, I think, without question, the peak of papal power. The popes of the High Middle Ages were extremely powerful figures indeed. And not only did they claim supreme authority within the church, but they also claimed a kind of political 
authority as well. And this is going to lead to clashes between popes and kings. And we'll talk about uh, one example of that in just a little bit. The High Middle Ages is also the time of the Crusades, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And I have to say, there were a few groups during the High Middle Ages, groups of Christians, who were not content with the church of their day, who formed dissident churches. And the rise of these dissident churches um, gave rise in turn to the Inquisition, which was an organ of the church meant to quash dissent. All right, politics. What do we say about politics during the High Middle Ages? As I said a moment ago, we look at these medieval kingdoms and we see them as pretty decentralized. Uh, kings were not always able to impose their authority on their own realm, but we do see in certain places, especially France and England, um, gradually increasing degrees of centralization. Now, one of the kingdoms that we're going to have to talk about from time to time during this entire course is the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire uh, was sort of situated roughly in modern day Germany. But I have to say from the beginning that the Holy Roman Empire is not as impressive as the name suggests. Um, because the Holy Roman emperors themselves were often quite ineffective in imposing their authority on their realm. So if you look at a map, and I urge you to do that, uh, there's several good ones in this week's reading in Western world. Um, if you just look at the map, you think, wow, Holy Roman Empire, that was one of the great sort of empires of the time. Um, there's some truth to that, but um, that's also, I think, a little overstated. Finally, the High Middle Ages, well, one of the reasons they get that name, the High Middle Ages, is because in some ways that period from 1000 to 1300 is seen as the high point of medieval culture. And um, this is because th this period gives rise to population growth, that population growth leads to a, an uptick in urbanization. So towns are expanding, new towns are being founded, and this leads to uh, a number of cultural achievements, not least of which is the rise of the university. So the university as we know it today really begins in the high Middle Ages, um, and so uh, I think it's good to be aware of that. So that's sort of the world that we are um, entering into as we begin our survey in the year 1300. So in this unit, and that means this week and next week, we are focused on the last phase of the Middle Ages, known rather unimaginatively as the Late Middle Ages. This is a period uh, roughly 1300 to 1500. We'll just kind of keep it nice and clean like that. This is usually seen as a period of social, cultural, and political decline. And there are reasons for thinking about this period that way. You're going to, to see that. I think when you read West in the World, you will not think, gee, I wish I had a time machine and I could go back and live in the 14th century. You're probably not going to have that reaction. But I do want to point out that there is more to the late Middle Ages than the Black Death and warfare and all of these horrible things you're going to read about. Um, it was a period of great cultural production Two of the greatest works of Western literature ever written are produced during this time period. We're going to read one of them this week, Dante's Inferno, and then next week we'll read parts of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So um, perhaps this is a period of decline, but that does not mean that it is a period that is barren of cultural achievement by no means. 
All right. Well, let's turn to some of the major topics that you will be reading about in West in the World this week. Um, and let me point out that there is a handout on Canvas. You might want to go ahead and download that, maybe print it out. That might be useful to have sort of at your side as you listen to this video and certainly as you read West in the World. So um, let's start with the Black Death. This is one of the defining phenomena of the late Middle Ages. Uh, you'll read all about sort of when and where and how it got started. The most important thing, of course, to understand about the Black Death was the toll that it took on um, European demographics. It's possible that in about three years, something like 35 million people died. And actually, that's kind of a conservative estimate. Uh, that would be about one-third of the European population, by the way. Some recent studies have actually suggested the death rate may have been higher, perhaps as many as 50 million out of a total of 80 million Europeans died. It's just absolutely mind-boggling. And that's just within a period of about three years. Now, the worst of the plague will subside around 1351, just going around 1347, subsides, the worst of it subsides by 1351, but you have to understand that for the next several decades, there's going to be these sort of um, further outbreaks, none of which will be as catastrophic as this initial one, but um, it's not as if um, the plague never returns, um, certainly not. Any uh, pandemic like this is going to have all sorts of consequences beyond simply the human toll. Um, there's going to be economic consequences. There's going to be social consequences. You're going to read about that. Um, and you're also going to read about how people responded sort of in the moment. And, of course, you have to, I think, in a way, ask yourself, how would I have responded if I lived through something like that? Uh, you're going to see everything from self-flagellation. You're going to read about these uh, men who sort of wandered around Europe um, whipping themselves because they believed that the, 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 the plague was a kind of punishment that God had inflicted on his people, and they were hoping to atone for that in some way. You're going to read about um, some extremely disturbing responses to the plague. Um, scapegoating. Uh, this is not terribly surprising, right? Things go wrong, and even if there is no real human cause, people want there to be a guilty party. And for many of Europeans at this time, um, they're going to go straight to the Jews, and they're going to blame the Jews. And there's several... Uh, terrible uh, pogroms, pogrom, P-O-G-R-O-M. Pogrom is a kind of mass killing, um, usually of Jews. Thousands of Jews will die because they're being scapegoated. And I just want to kind of flag this for a moment because, of course, this humanities program we have at Milligan goes all the way to the 20th century. And one of the last things that you'll study in the course is the rise of the Third Reich in Germany, um, the final solution, the Holocaust. And it just raises this question, what is it about um, the Jews being, being used as scapegoats again and again? How do we explain that? And, and what do we do now? Uh, it's not as if anti-Semitism is dead, by no means. So... Um, I hope you will, at several points in this course, um, I hope you'll take what you're learning about the past and help it to allow it to open your eyes to some things that are going on in the present as well. Um, in addition to these sort of immediate reactions, there's going to be long-lasting 
economic and social consequences to the Black Death. I mean, during the Black Death, the worst of it, 1347, 1350, economic life, commercial life pretty much shuts down entirely in Europe. And so it's going to take a long time, uh, centuries really in many ways, for the European economy to recover. Uh, of course, some peasants are going to see this as an opportunity for some upward mobility, an opportunity to throw off the oppressive yoke of their landlords. But the landlords of Europe are very loath to allow that to happen. So you're going to read about uh, several revolts that happen in Europe in the decades after the Black Death, um, revolts that occur because um, uh, landlords are still insisting, even in this very different world that they're living in, insisting on all, all of their old privil privileges and prerogatives. So um, the Black Death is, again, one of the defining moments of this whole period that we call the Late Middle Ages. Late Middle Ages is also defined or characterized by a great deal of turmoil within the church. Ecclesiastical turmoil. Ecclesiastical is just an adjective meaning having to do with the church. Um, you need to know something about the Avignon Papacy. You'll be reading about this, Avignon, A-V-I-G-N-O-N. -N. Avignon is a city in what is now southern France. The Avignon Papacy is a period of time in which the popes resided in Avignon, which is about a thousand kilometers away from Rome, um, rather than Rome. And this, this was seen as scandalous by a number of people uh, for reasons I'll get into in just a moment. Just to give you a little bit of context, I mentioned a moment ago that the Middle Ages witnessed a number of conflicts between kings and popes because they really didn't sort of agree on the boundaries of their authority. And we see this at the beginning of the 14th century in the conflict between the French king Philip IV and the Pope Boniface VIII. And Boniface VIII is um, uh, one of Dante's sort of arch nemeses. So that's a good connection between the history that we're reading about this week and Dante's Inferno. So uh, you'll, you'll hear about Boniface VIII a bit more. Um, you can read about what they were fighting over in West in the World. Here's what you need to know um, for now. When, when Boniface died, Philip was able to put pressure on the cardinals. Cardinals are the figures who elect popes, and that's true to this day. He was able to put pressure on the cardinals uh, so that they would elect a French pope, someone who would sort of play ball with Philip. They do that. They elect the Frenchman who takes the name Clement V. And Clement, in the year 1305, is going to move the papacy to Avignon. And the papacy would remain there for decades until 1377. Now, you need to think about why this matters at all, why this would be seen as a big deal, why this would be seen by a lot of people as positively scandalous. Well, think about it for a moment. The pope's official title is the Bishop of Rome. So he is the head of the Church of Rome, but now he is residing a thousand kilometers away. And just imagine if you went to a church here in East Tennessee and your senior minister moved to California, but still intended to be your senior minister, I think Many of us would say, you know, there's just something not quite right about that. So this was um, seen by many Christians as uh, a, an unbecoming kind of thing for the Pope to do. It would seem that his, or there, I should say, because there's a number of Avignon Popes, it would seem that their um, political priorities took precedent over their spiritual 
priorities. Well, finally, in 1377, the papacy does return to Rome. But the very next year, that pope, the pope who had moved back to Rome, he died. So there had to be another papal election. The cardinals met in Rome. There was a lot of pressure on them to elect an Italian pope to help keep the papacy back in Rome, where it belonged. Well, they do. They elect an Italian pope. He takes the name Urban VI. The only problem is Urban VI turns out to be a bit of a nutcase. And so uh, soon thereafter, the cardinals sort of call a mulligan, and they say, okay, well, we're going to vote again. And um, so we're going to elect a new pope. So forget about that other pope we elected. He turned out to be uh, kind of a dud. So we've elected this new pope, Clement VII, and he just happens to be a cousin of the French king. Now, this is going to lead to an extremely awkward, to put it lightly, situation. Because Urban VI, the first pope who was elected, is not about to step down. So now we have two popes. Urban VI is going to remain in Rome, somewhat unsurprisingly. Clement VII, remember he's the cousin of the French king, he goes back to Avignon. So now we have two competing popes. Um, and this situation is known as the Great Schism. Schism is a division. Because now all Christians in Europe are going to have to decide to which pope will they pledge their allegiance. So the Great Schism begins in the year 1378 and will last all the way until 1417. So just think about it this way. The Avignon Papacy and the Great Schism are distinct phenomena, right? The Great Schism uh, begins the year after the Avignon Papacy ends, but obviously they are related phenomena. Now, this is a real crisis for the church, uh, both at the practical level, but also at the sort of spiritual level as well, because this does a lot of damage to the church's prestige and um, to the church's sort of spiritual authority. And increasingly, Christians become convinced, at least many Christians become convinced, that the only way to sort out this mess is to have a great council, uh, a council of bishops that would determine who the one true pope ought to be. Now, the first major council happens at Pisa, in Italy in 1409-1410, but it was a bit of a bust because it really just kind of adds insult to injury. A third pope is elected, um, you know, intended to be the sole pope, but the other two guys are still not stepping down. So now we have three competing popes. But a few years later, the Council of Constance, which lasted from 1414 to 1417, Finally, the Great Schism is resolved. The uh, three popes that had been competing were sort of put out of the picture, um, either voluntarily or involuntarily, involuntarily, and a, a new pope, uh, Martin V, is elected. So the schism is resolved, but the damage to the church's reputation is uh, not going to be so easily put to the side. And indeed, you'll read that this period, the late, the late Middle Ages, is a period of mounting disaffection uh, among Christians concerning the church, the institutional church. You're going to read about John Wycliffe in England. You're going to read about Jan Hus in what is now the Czech Republic. And these two figures really become lightning rods for uh, that, that disaffection. Um, that's not to say that, that, that everyone or even most Christians were unhappy with the church, uh, but certainly some were. All right. Um, boy, I really don't have much more time. Really quickly, 100 years war. Okay, it's actually over 100 years if you look at the dates, 1337 to 1453. The broader point is that the 14th century is one of the most violent 
centuries in European history, right up there with the 20th century. Um, and this is, as you might guess, the Hundred Years War, the longest war in European history. Although I should hasten to add that it's not as if fighting is continuous during this period. There are periods of truce within that span of 1337 to 13 um, uh, to 1453. Um, you may have, if you've had me before in class or online, you may have heard me say that when it comes to studying wars, it can be very easy to be, uh, to just sort of drown in minutia. So when you're, when you're studying a, a new war, think about the three C's. If you can get the three C's, you're going to be okay. The first C is combatants. So simply put, who's fighting each other? And of course, in this case, it's the English and the French. Secondly, causes. Why did this war get started in the first place? And what are the combatants hoping for? And then finally, consequences. Now, that includes short-term consequences, like who won the war, um, but also long-term consequences, and not just military and political consequences, but social consequences, economic consequences, cultural consequences, maybe even religious consequences. So all those things, those three Cs, those are more important than uh, knowing about specific battles or military tactics or, or, or anything like that. Um, so um, I think I'm going to, because we're, we're running short on time, I'm going to leave it to you to sort of work those things out when you read about the Hundred Years' War. I mean, your textbook is going to give you everything you need to get those three C's nailed down. So I'm just going to um, let you do that work as you read. And finally, I'll also point out that you're going to read about some developments to the east, some of the great empires to the east of Western Europe, the Mongols, the Ottomans, the Russians. That's fair game for the weekly quiz. One thing you need to understand about these videos that I make every week is that I, I'm never going to be able to cover everything. So you've got to use your study guide to help make sure that uh, you have a comprehensive knowledge, that nothing has kind of fallen between the cracks, and so on. But let me hasten to add that I urge you to reach out to me, get in touch with me if you have any questions about the reading. If there's something that I don't address in one of the videos, if it's something that is confusing to you, please reach out, ask me, I'll help you find the answer, and that way you'll be much better prepared for your weekly quiz. So I'll stop there.